Hey, today we talked to Sam Silverstein, author of over 12 books on accountability. He's like this uh, accountability expert, and we dive into how imp- how accountability can be a real fuel for your organization, but it really starts with people. So I hope you enjoy this episode of The Ethics Experts, and check out Sam uh, everywhere books are sold. Welcome to The Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you're a returning subscriber, hey, Bestie. Hope you're having an amazing day. You look amazing today, by the way. You see what happens when you join The Ethics Experts. You get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So hit the subscribe button. Join us as we change the world by making our workplaces better. I got a great treat for you today. I got the most trusted voice in accountability, Sam Silverstein. He uh, He's somebody who really knows how to... Um, articulate the importance of accountability in workplaces. He's the author of 12 books on leadership and accountability. Uh, He has researched uh, why companies have an incredible culture that that inspires people to be accountable and produce highly profitable results and has worked with companies like Kraft, PetSmart, Pfizer, the Mayo Clinic. He is a member of the Speakers Hall of Fame. So that's something I aspire to. I didn't even know that that existed, but I'd love to have my name uh, in the Speakers Hall of Fame. Uh, And he's a, uh, in Global Gurus, has repeatedly listed Sam Silverstein as one of the world's top organizational cultural perspective. professionals. So on the ethics experts, we're always trying to talk about culture. Culture is the only sustainable competitive advantage in business. Uh, Sam, we were introduced by Tom Fox, who's one of your old friends. And man, we just hit it off right off the bat. And I was like, man, I got to get this guy on the ethics experts. So welcome. How's it going, buddy? Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's nice having mutual friends. Hey, it's just nice having friends. Yeah. But um, (laughs) it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing the time together and hopefully providing some value for your listeners and viewers. So let's talk about like your your journey into this game. I'm sure when you were uh, an eight-year-old, you weren't thinking, man, I'm going to be the, uh, the accountability guru, the most trusted voice in accountability. What is it about your journey that really kind of pushed you into this field? Wow, great question. Yeah, actually, when I was six, no. Um, <laughs> you know, here's the thing. I I wrote my first book and started speaking professionally. And based on my business background, I spoke on a lot of the topics. I spoke on personal development. I spoke on leadership. I spoke on sales, relationship building, strategic planning, creative marketing. I mean, I have an MBA. I've run my own companies. You know, I have this business background. And and finally, it got to the point where I realized I was all over the place. Nobody knew what I did or how I was making an impact. And so I challenged myself and I sat down and I said, okay, what's at the very core of this? What drives success for individuals and businesses? What is the, the foundation? And I realized that everything I did came back to accountability. And it was in that moment that I put my blinders on. And when I did that, I started to see accountability accountability totally differently. And I started to go deeper, deeper, deeper and do case studies. And my writings were focused. And and when you focus on something really in a micro fashion, you'd start to discover some things. And that's what started to happen. And then everything changed from that point forward. So what a light bulb moment to see that, you know, the common ingredient in all of these different things and all the things you, you, you were talking about was accountability. Talk to me about that light bulb moment and talk to me about like that journey into this. You know, I think a lot of people are scared to sort of get myopic on things and really kind of burrow deep on something. But I think when you do that, you, you end up, it ends up being a lot bigger than people fear it to be because then you probably start to see it everywhere and you see it kind of like resonating through all of these different companies and all these different situations and all these probably individuals who are very accountable to themselves and stuff. So so talk to us a little bit about some of those, um, you know, some of those, you know, those, those revelations that you had on this journey, because I think there's a lot to learn from it. So We think sometimes that if we just focus on one thing, we're narrowing opportunities, either as individuals or in our organizations and our businesses. The reality is, is when we focus on one thing to the point of obsession, then we get very good at that one thing. And so in a business, for instance, if you're a leader, you want to focus on one thing and to an obsession and become very good at that, 
focus on your people. Don't focus on the bottom line. Don't focus right. on your sales systems. Don't focus on your people. And if you become obsessive about taking care of, supporting, and 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 helping your people thrive, then they will focus on the bottom line. They will create new sales systems. They will come up with ideas. And then the whole team will help raise what's happening with the organization. For me, I put the lens on of accountability. And when I when I would meet a leader, when I would work with an organization, when I did case studies, that myopic focus created a situation where I started to see things that I never saw before. And I realized my greatest discovery was that accountability is not a way of doing, it's a way of thinking. That there's a difference between tactical commitments and relational commitments. And that you're responsible for things, but you're accountable to people. So accountability is between people. It's not about leadership trying to manipulate someone to do more for them. It's about leadership creating an environment, a workplace culture that inspires people to choose to be their best and to be accountable. And that is 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 really the understanding that a lot of leaders don't have. They think it's about holding their people accountable, which is like putting a gun to their head. No, it's about creating an environment, a culture. And so that's why we've, over time, become experts at culture, because accountability flows out of culture. So talk to me a little bit about that distinction between um, tactical commitments and relational commitments and how – I mean, it seems like like it's kind of this this paradox, which you kind of alluded to before. It's like if you want great results, don't focus on those results. Focus on the inputs. Focus on the inputs to the system and the outputs will kind of take care of themselves. That's kind of the – the cliff's notes of what you said. And I think paradoxically, don't put that gun to people's head for accountability, but rather establish these kinds of relationships or create this type of an environment that allows for kind of an unfettered, I think, you know, pursuit of the organizational mission by way of people deploying their gifts, you know, consistently or something. But like, you know, you said, you said leaders get that wrong. Do they err more on the side of the sort of tactical commitments versus the relational commitments? And what do you think drives that like, uh, drives that you know that like miss uh i mean they're like aiming at the wrong thing like what's driving that you know okay so there were really five questions in there so there's like five or six yeah (laughs) i know that's okay and there might be one or two that i just had in for the heck of it okay great let's break this down um here here's the underlying concept you talked about inputs and outputs early on um action follows belief so So here's the thing. When something's not working in an organization, we tend to say we have to fix this system. Well, we need to fix our accounts payable system. We need to fix our sales system. We need to fix customer service. We need to fix whatever it is. The reality is it's not a system that needs to be fixed. It's a way of thinking that needs to be fixed. If something's not working in your business, in your life, in your community, whatever it is, What is the belief that is driving the action that's causing that not to work? So don't try to fix a system. Try to fix a way of thinking. Why are people in your company coming and going like crazy, but in another organization, they have very low turnover? Well, there's a belief that leadership has that's driving that either ability to retain people or the inability to retain people, and so it's a revolving door. It's a belief. And so understanding what that belief is and then addressing that is going to solve the problem ultimately. So that's foundational. Now, with regards to accountability, people think it's about getting stuff done. Get stuff done. Get stuff done. I'm going to hold you accountable. You're going to be accountable. Well, it doesn't work that way. And so when leaders try to do that, they just, they manifest and continue a challenge. It's not going to go away. So I can walk into your office and go, I'm going to hold you accountable, get this stuff done. And you know what? You're going to work your tail off until noon or until this afternoon or until tomorrow morning, but then it's gone. That doesn't work. So what does work? What works is building relationships. I know that when an organization and, and we measure accountability in an organization. We have a product called the Culture Audit. We use this. We measure 16, 16 things like ethics and compliance. We measure that. We measure DEI. We measure 
um, engagement. We measure accountability because we're the only ones that truly know how to measure accountability. I know if accountability is high in your organization, that if you're mastering accountability, you're probably mastering relationships. Because you know what? I'm not going to be accountable to someone I don't like. Now, when leadership puts their people first because they truly value people, well, the people feel that. And that's a belief by the leader. The leader believes people are important. Their families are important. Their lives are important. They would never say something like, oh, this isn't personal. This is business. Because every interaction between two human beings is always personal, even if you're talking about business. So when a leader gets that, and that's where the struggle begins, then what happens is they take on these relational commitments. So tactical commitments are spoken, agreed upon, um, and, and and they're transactional. Like, I'll get you the report tomorrow by 3 o'clock. Oh, Sam, I've, I've, I've got a meeting at 3 o'clock. Can you get it to me before lunch so that I have time to review it? Yeah, I'll get it to you before lunch. It's spoken. It's agreed upon. It's transactional. It's ta- That's what makes it tactical. So th- that's a responsibility. Now, a relational commitment would be a commitment to live the values, a commitment to stand by you when all hell breaks loose, a commitment to it's all of us, which means the leader is taking the position. If you fail, I fail. Only when you succeed do I succeed. A commitment to a good name, a commitment to the truth. There's 10 of these. So when a leader now, a relational commitment is unspoken. It's taken on by the leader and it contributes to a relationship. So what happens is when a leader is doing these things, the people feel it. Wow, she's always there for me. She's got my back. She 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 makes sure that um, I, I'm I'm successful. I would rather die than let her down. Do you see the difference? Yeah, like you said, the first one is very transactional. It's very surface level. The other one is kind of you feel it in your heart or you feel it in your stomach. And, um, you know, it's like the action sort of prove it or it's, it creates sort of this self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, you know, I work well, with my brother. I would never let him down. You know, he could be in a room of enemies. I'm standing in there with him. And if we're taking a beating together, then we're doing that or whatever. Like I would never betray him. And that to your point manifests in a lot of different ways. You know what I mean? Right. So w- one of those relational commitments is a commitment to discover and lead you to your potential, to be your very best. Well, look, if you come into my office and you go, Sam, you know, you're really good at what you're doing, but I think you could do this. Now, I know, I know you're not trained in that, but I'm going to give you the training. I'm going to get you the training. I'm going to support you, and I'm going to be behind you as long as it takes because I think you'd be amazing at this. Am I going to leave you? I've got someone that I report to that is looking out for me, that wants me to be my best, is willing to train me for new opportunities. I'm not going anywhere else. I'd rather die than let you down. Accountability is a relational topic, not a tactical one. Now, the challenge is the leaders focus on the bottom line. We got to hit our numbers. We got to hit our numbers this quarter. We got to hit our numbers. They're so focused on that. Well, Yeah, you got to hit your numbers. That's our responsibility. But if you take care of me and help me succeed, I'm going to break my back to help us achieve and hit our numbers. That's the way accountability really works. It's inspired in people. It's not mandated. And so when you do that, then what happens is there you create a culture where this is inspired in people. You create a culture where Ethics is stepped out at a high degree. You create a culture where people don't want to do what's wrong. They want to do what's right. It's a cultural issue. That's why we measure the culture. So when you bring this to an organization, you bring this framework to someone and they're just like firing on all cylinders. They love it. It's resonating deeply with them. They're like, I love this. I want to do this. Or maybe they see that they've already kind of done that to some degree and they've maybe had their light bulb turned on that the source of the accountability is not that tactical thing. It's really rooted in this relational thing. How do we successfully roll that out across an organization? You know what I'm saying? How do we McDonaldize this? Is it a top-down cultural thing? Is there a playbook for folks to say, hey, you know, before you start holding somebody accountable to get you that report by the end of the day or for the sales team to hit your numbers, you really just need to spend some time investing in them. 
I'm, I'm sure there's not a silver bullet. I'm sure it's different kind of across the board, but in all of your experience, what have you seen, uh, in terms of how people can successfully like, you know, well, step up the level of like creation. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, that's what we do. We work with leaders and organizations to help them build this in their organization. We have certified accountability advisors that either work for us or, or that, that are, that are independent, that are certified by us that go into organizations that do that. We, we train up certified accountability advisors within organizations and then give them all the tools they need to make this happen. And what happens is this, it starts at the very highest level. If the, if the CEO, the president of the organization doesn't really truly care about their people, if it's just a meritocracy, mm -hmm. then it's not going to happen. If the head of HR gets it, but the person they report to doesn't get it, then the, the head of HR is going to always be undermined. So it has to start at the highest level. And when the, and when the leader at the highest level, um, is enlightened to this, then, then what happens is then we step out getting everyone on board. It starts with having a set of values that is being lived throughout the organization that you hire to the values, you fire to the values, you, you have defined your culture through those values. And then it's a matter of teaching leaders how to understand what these 10 relational commitments are, and then how to step them out and how to teach them at all levels. So what happens, it's water flowing through the organization. We start here, we work with here, we work with here, and you get everybody on board realizing that when you create an organization that cares about people and understands how to do that in conjunction with an expectation of a high level of performance, both quantity and quality, because you can love someone and at the same time, you can still expect great work. They're not mutually independent. And when you understand how to go about that, then you transform your culture to where people feel cared for, they feel valued, and they want to be a part of a team that's performing at the highest possible level. People want to be a part of a team that performs at a highest level. They want to be part of a team that is valued and appreciated. And when both of those exist, that's what happens. If only one exists, that's when the door is a, is a turnstile and people are coming and going. So you said something before about it. Like, do you think um, a meritocracy and this sort of people over everything mentalities can exist together? Or do you think one is always going to win out over another? Like, are they mutually exclu exclusive in your mind? Or do you feel like they're um, so collaborative or what, something? Your culture is defined by your values. Now, your values. I mean, we have been doing this for years. We've helped companies either analyze their existing values or, or start from scratch, put them aside and start from scratch. Your values need to connect to five specific areas. If it's going to be a great set of values, you can't just have great values. You have to have a great set. And if somebody wants a, some insight on that, they can, for free, they can go to valuesworksheet.com and, and we have a free values worksheet that they can look at and use and we're happy to give that away. But what happens is you need to have foundational values. Foundational values speak to the character of the organization, the integrity of the organization. Then there's professional values. Now, professional values speak to what is excellence here? Because why would you want anything less than excellence? Then there's relational values, and there's two parts to this. There's internal relationships and external relationships. And so you need to define what those relationships are like. Do we respect each other? Do we help each other? Do we communicate with each other? How do we communicate? And then there's community values. How do we connect to and serve the community in which we live and work? And when you cover all five of those areas, four and a half, if you want to look at relationships as one, um, internal, external, then what happens is that defines, those are the rules of the sandbox, that defines how we live here. So we have, we have a, a value that says we do great work, it's excellent, it's done on a timely basis, when we make mistakes, we fix them fast, um, you know, so you have something that talks about the quality of work, but then we value the people. 
we, we trust our people. We communicate face to face when we can. And only when we can't do we communicate over the phone. And only when that doesn't work, do we try to communicate via text or email or whatever it is. And so we, we respect people. Well, if we respect people and you are disrespecting me, then your boss should come and talk to you. And if you continue to do it, your boss has to allow you to go elsewhere. In other words, they fire you. If they let you stay, then this, this we respect people doesn't exist. So your values have to be non-negotiable. You define in there the relationships and the level of performance. And then everyone in the organization has to live those values. And you, anyone that's not willing to live the values, you allow them to go elsewhere and you replace them with people who want to live those values. And what happens in very short order is you have this this organization made up of people who are connected through the values, not the products and services. And that's where you get this high degree of performance, as well as a high degree of relationship of people who care about each other and want each other to succeed. Now, what's going to happen when you're in an organization where people want each other to succeed, they're all working their tails off to do their very best. You're going to outperform your competition, right. which means this shows up on the bottom block. So it's almost like those values are the bridge between these two things of like people and, you know, meritocracy or performance, you know, to kind of boil that down. That's going to be the, the sinew that kind of attaches that, that muscle to that sort of skeletal structure. If they are designed properly, if they are believed by leadership, and if they are made non-negotiable. However, here's the problem. Organizations are great at, you know, it's like a marketing exercise. Yeah, totally. It's, oh, we need a set of values, you know? So that we make our values, we put them on the website, we put them on the wall, they go in the drawer and we forget about them. If you're not talking about your values literally every day, every time you make a decision, every meeting that you have, if this isn't the code that you live by, then your values aren't real in all your people, all your people. And, and they do you no good. And so... The values have to be lived to the, that's why I wrote the book, non-negotiable. The values have to be lived to the level of non-negotiable. You want to stay here. This is what it takes. You live these values. And those values, again, it's not just about character. It's about relationships. It's about the quality of work. It's how we support the community. When you have that whole picture, you literally can have it all. So what do companies get wrong with values? Because values in and of themselves is not a, a new concept. As long as I've been around, there's been value pages on every website that I've ever seen. But what I do see, to your point, is that they're fake. They feel inauthentic. Um, you know, we talk about this gap between the aspirational culture, those words on the wall, and the actual culture, what people experience. And I think if people don't see that the organization is trying to close that gap – then it feels like values washing or green washing or whatever, whatever washing you want to call it. How do we, you know, how do we, you know, um, how do we actually do close that gap? Yeah. How do we make oh, okay. it real? Or how do, how, how does somebody right. in an organization that has that page who believes them and is trying to live them out on their team, spread that fire across the organization so that the it's average simple. person feels it. All right. So here's the thing. It's simple. It's, but it's, it's not necessarily easy. First of all, people are so concerned with money. So I was, you know, I was working with a, a law firm and they had this guy that's nothing but a troublemaker, disrespects people. I'm like, why is he here? Oh, he brings in a lot of business. He brings in over a million dollars worth of revenue every year. Well, so, so. Let me just, I just want to make sure I understand this. You can be a jerk if you bring in a lot of revenue. That's, is that what you're saying? Well, if that's what they're saying, then the values, their value is revenue over respect. Actions speak louder than words. That's what my dad always told me. You cannot tell me that respect is your value if you let someone stay in the organization that does not live respect to the people that they're working with. Yeah, especially if you don't even address it. Well, yeah, but you can address it, but if they don't change, so let me paint another scenario. In that scenario, I would say the leader does not believe respect is a value. Yeah, Now right. you can say, oh, sure they do. They put it down. No, 
Their actions tell me they don't believe it. You, you, it's not your words that tell me what you believe. It's your actions. Listen, remember, I said action follows belief. Your actions tell me what you believe. So is the leader strong enough to go, you know what, Joe, you know, we, you know these are values. We talked about them when you came on board. We talk about them in all of our meetings. We connect our decisions to them. You and I have sat down on two separate occasions, and you know, you're know you not respecting the people that report to you that you like your support team or whatever. I'm going to have to let you go. Now, when a leader does that, especially when it's a high producer, you just sent a message to the entire organization. Right. These values are real. Now, what happens in that moment? Everyone goes, wow, they really believe this. I better believe this also. They go, wow, they're willing to get rid of the number one producer. They must believe in us that we can take up the slack. I better up my game. You see what I do? And then, and then they go, wow, I really appreciate that. They got rid of that jerk who was making my life miserable. I need to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to make this office successful because they're looking out for me. I need to look out for them. Now you need to balance that. One time I had some, a, a CEO said, but I can't afford to let go of, of people. I, there's just, I, I don't get enough people there. And, and I don't get enough good people. I don't get enough people. And so I asked another CEO once I asked him, I said, what do you tell someone that, that, responds like that. And this is a guy in an area where unemployment is zero. And when they post a job, they have between 60 and 100 applicants for the job. And his response was, well, maybe he hasn't built a company good enough to attract those people. So it's scary on the front end. I'm not going to say it's not scary. But when you let go of people because they're not living the values, the word gets out really quick. These people believe in these values. This is a great place to work. You want to be a part of this. And then what happens is you start attracting two things. You start attracting people who want to live those values, and you start attracting people who want to perform at a high level. Because you know what? I want to perform at a high level. But I don't want to be in an environment where others aren't performing at a high level because you always work down to that lowest common denominator. That's true. So you get rid of those people. But how do you balance that lowest common denominator, um, you know, how do you delete that lowest common denominator performance and balance that against the relational piece of the puzzle, which is the foundation for everything we're talking about, and not turn it into a profits over everything or performance over everything culture? Like, well, how do you not create this sort of negative self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, that lowest common denominator might be the jerk who's disrespecting people. That's what makes that person the lowest common denominator is their attitude. Okay. But remember, there's a value for perform. There's one of the values talks about what excellence is. Okay. I, look, here's the thing. I was talking with then CEO of Happy State Bank, real bank in Texas. Uh, they were a case study for my one of my books. And one of their values is family first. Now, family first to them, this is what it means. This is a bank. If it's four o'clock in the afternoon and your son or daughter has a soccer competition, a game, a cheerleading competition, a band concert, there's some family event and you're at work and your reason for not being at the family event is work. That's a dismissible occurrence. They believe family first. They believe it. They don't just say it. They believe it. Now, they'll tell you they've never had to fire anybody over it, but they believe it. Family first. Now, they have another value, and this value is PDI is what is known at the bank. And PDI stands for produce, damn it. <laughs> and it says you got to get your work done. you got to do a lot of work, and you have to do it at a high level. They come out and say that. That's the expectation. Um. And so I said, oh, so PDI is the opposite of family first. And he looked at me like I was crazy because I didn't get it at this point, okay? I didn't understand that. 
He says, no, they have nothing to do with each other. They're both values. We value family first and we value doing a great job. Why can't you value both? Yeah, right. And so what does that mean? Well, some people, you see people coming, you see cars in the bank parking lot at seven o'clock at night or on Saturday afternoon, because you know what? I left early to go see my daughter's soccer game, but I came back because I had to get something done because you were depending on my, on me and I needed to make sure I got it done. And so I'm not telling other organizations what their values should be. I'm just saying you need to have a great set of values and you need to live those values and you need to charge your people with the responsibility to figure out how to do that. Do you and think the name of the game you, is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you can have it all. Yeah. As long as you insist on living the values. But if you don't believe those values in your heart, then you won't be stepping them out and living them. Maybe put it put another way, I think a lot of um, values issues in companies are due to an inaccurate portrayal of what the true values are. There's these sort of aspirational values that sound really nice, that it's like this marketing thing, that that's not really what the what the values of the organization are. Do you think an organization could really just kind of shortcut this conversation by analyzing and seeing like, well, what are our actual values? And maybe it's not family first. Maybe it's performance over everything and maybe it's profits over everything. Do you think there's value in a clear articulation of whatever those values are, irrespective of whether they're, you know, good values, you know, from like an average sort of perception? So let's call it honesty and transparency. And yeah, I, I think, look, I don't want to work for, I don't want to work for an organization that values profits over people. All right. See, I believe that when you value people, over profit, then what happens is the people will value the profit and they will make it happen. I believe you can have it all. I've just seen it happen too many times. Agree. But, but to your point, if, if it's just about the job and that's what it's about, at least put that out there up front. And then I'm assuming there's benefits that, you know, people are, are getting because of that. And that, hopefully has them stay and they come into the environment knowing, you know what, this is 60 hours a week, 65 hours a week. And this is how it is here. And this is what we expect. Well, at least be honest about that. Because if you're not, as soon as I find out I'm gone. So why wouldn't you be honest about that? Now, that's not the type of organization that we would work with or consult with. That's not the type of organization that would even hire us. But I just don't think you have to go that way. But if that's who you are, at least be honest. Well, I'm just saying, like, think about, you know, uh, generic New York, you know, Manhattan Investment Bank, where you're probably going to be working 80 hours a week. And I think everybody takes those jobs, not even looking at those values pages, because they kind of know what they're signing up for. Or look at the Marines. Like, you know, boot camp's going to be brutal. And you know, you know, I mean, people self-select into to the Marines over the Air the Force, Marines for example. The Marines have a set of values, and they step out those values, and they live Agreed. those values. Yeah, yeah, agree, for sure. Not, but and, I, I'm, I'm just saying that, like, there's a clarity in each of these examples that we just talked about around what somebody can expect coming into it. Nobody's stepping into the Marines thinking that it's going to be kind of a walk in the park. It's going to be – guys are self-selecting into it, and nobody's stepping into, you know, investment bank, whatever you want to call it. Uh, thinking that they're going to work a 40 hour a week job. So, they see how that fits into maybe their broader career or they like that lifestyle and they want to get the Hermes ties or whatever. They like what kind of goes along with it. I'm just saying that clarity of values has value sure. in and of itself with, in terms of attracting to maybe back to your other point, attracting people that are going to want to live those out or want to live in that environment or something. Absolutely. And people are taking those jobs with the investment firms because they see that as a, a fast road to extremely high income and they can hit monetary goals. And there's nothing wrong with that. All I'm going to say is I don't think a company has to be built that way. I agree with you. I, just, I agree. Yeah. I mean, philosophically, I don't philosophically. I I'm kind of more on your page of, you know, if you, I can't control the harvest, but I can control how I, till my field and how, you know, how I plant my seeds and how I tend to that, to that field. And the harvest is going to kind of take care of itself. And 
I personally have gotten comfortable with this longer term view of, you know, I think culture, like I said, is the only sustainable competitive advantage. I think we're in a world where people are our assets, you know, to not, you know, that's, that's the fact to get anything done in an organization, especially in this knowledge work economy requires an actual engagement of human beings. And those human beings need to feel engaged. They need to feel valued. I mean, I can look at my own career when I've worked in toxic environments versus ones where I felt really, really valued. And in the first one, I was not nearly as engaged as I was where I felt like, cool, I'm making a difference in the world and my gifts are valued and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm growing. So I'm definitely on that side of the fence, you know? Right. And, and so let's just step back from that another bit, low. I think, and this is important. If you want ethics to be high in an organization, if you want people to act with ethical behavior, then ethics has to be valued more than money. Right. And in an organization, and we see this all the time, we see this in these banks and accounting firms that are cheating on, on exams and, and, and in banks that are setting up accounts for people that don't exist or setting up accounts that people don't know about because they've got these performance numbers that are right. hanging over their head and the pressure to perform is, is greater than anything else. Companies create these environments that encourage people to cheat, yeah, that right. encourage a lack of ethics. And so even being upfront and honest about that kind of environment doesn't justify it and doesn't make it right. Agree. Does it, is it inevitable that it just breaks down, though, at some size, at some scale, once you go public or something where you have all this sort of analyst pressure and this Wall Street pressure and you have all these layers of incentives? You've got people on the board. You have CEOs who have all, the, all of this compensation tied to, you know, stock performance. Doesn't have to. Yeah. Doesn't have to be that way. I mean, I mean it, it, let, me, let me ask you this. Are you married? I am. Okay, so I do have I quarterly reviews cheat? though. I'm just kidding. <laughs> can I get you to cheat? No. Are you well but what happens when the the monetary value for cheating goes up? What Are you talking about cheating on my the, wife? Yeah. Oh, like what like would it would I cheat for a billion dollars or something? Is yeah. that what you're asking me? Yeah. I wouldn't. No. Okay, so, 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 so it doesn't have to be that way. That's my point. So does, does the fact that a public company has to respond to uh, the board of directors, to the stock market, to the SEC, does that impact? Yes. But can you have a set of values that you're going to live and you're going to stick to it? You can. You just have to decide that's who you are, that, that that's yeah. what you believe. Now, here's where the challenge comes in, and I'll just put this out there. The challenge comes in, you can take a company. It's a small company. You started out, you and two cousins, and there were three of you. And now, all of a sudden, you have 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 employees. You've gone public, blah, 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 blah. Everything's fine. But as soon as you retire and someone takes your place... That's when the challenge comes in yeah, right. because that person may not buy into the values and the importance of those values the way that you did. And that's the biggest challenge to the culture. I mean, at some level, we're just talking about character. You know, what's the character of the organization? What's the, you know, the reputation is not a rep, you know, maybe um, like the reputation, your reputation is not based on, to your point, what you say. It's what you do, i.e. what you have done. Not what you say that you're going to do. That's future. The only sort of data set that is compiled into that reputation, which is the expression of the character, to your point, is a bunch of stuff that you've done. So if there's somebody else at the helm or whatever, that can very quickly change the character of the organization because I think to the point that you were just making, the character is determined by the decisions you make the, you know, which path you take when you get that decision, you know, when you're at that sort of crossroads or, or whatever, and the accumulation of those end up sort of defining the shape of the thing, you know? Exactly. And that's all a choice. And the first choice we have is we get to choose what we believe. So having clarity and knowing what you believe, what you believe about everything, 
and what that's based on is critical. Right. Because you can't step out a set of values unless you know whether or not you believe those values. Um, this is this is cool. Let's talk about your. Uh, you know, you've written twelve books. That's a lot of books. Um, I. Uh, that's a great. That's a cool thing to have done. Let's talk about your most recent book, or maybe you know your favorite. Maybe you can't pick your favorite, but maybe your books aren't listening. So we all have a favorite kid. Maybe we all have a favorite book. Talk to me about uh, what you know your most recent one and one of your one of your best ones that you would direct somebody to to really get you know some bang for the page. You know. Yeah, talking about your books is like talking about your babies. You know, um, you're not supposed to have a favorite. Um, <laughs> I, I have four children. I don't have a favorite. I do have certain ones that I'm happier with on one day over another. But you know, I think that's kind of natural. But totally. They're yeah, all, yeah. you know, I love them all. And okay, so my my most recent book is the Accountability Advantage, and that book is all about building a high performance, sustainable workplace culture that inspires people to be their best and Positions organizations have a more powerful impact, positive impact in their community. So if that's something that you're interested in, if, if, if your workplace culture is important to you, well, the accountability advantage is going to direct straight to that. And it's a powerful book. Um, another book that I'm really, really proud of is, is uh, the, the Theory of Accountability. And this is all about understanding the mindsets of accountability and literally how to go about creating the life and or business you want by, by embracing the mindsets of accountability and employing them in every decision that you make and every action that you take. So, um, you is, know, I, isn't it crazy how accountability just builds so much confidence? I mean, in yourself, like if you can be accountable to yourself, if you're accountable to your partner, it builds confidence. Again, maybe it's just going, going full circle back to what you said at the start. It builds confidence in that relationship. If you have an organization where you feel like there is this, you know, this like net, this network or, or whatever of like authentic accountability, you can be confident that, you know, of the person who's standing next to you in the foxhole and the, you know, whatever analogy you, you want to use it just, it's such a reinforcement. It, it turns into such a powerful fuel for performance, I think. So it does. And I love that observation. And the reason is, is because you as an individual have this, this underlying fundamental understanding of what it is that you believe. That's the only way that you can be accountable. And when you know what you believe, then you know how to step out every decision that you make. And, you know, they say, oh, that's a tough decision. Well, it's not when you have clarity of belief, right? Because all you're doing is making decisions that align with your beliefs. In a business, you you're making decisions that align with your values. We measure that in part of our culture audit. Yeah. Do the people in the organization make decisions that align with the values? Do you want that to be a very high number percentage wise? Because then they're making great decisions. So yeah, anyone that wants more information on. All, you know, the books are all available, obviously, on Amazon, but they can go to winwithsam.com, W-I-N with Sam.com. All the books are there. They're accessible. Um, we love we love it when people want to engage with 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 our books because our mission is to build a more accountable world. Our mission is to help leaders build more accountable workplace culture. And we only do that when people engage with us. Well, I love it. Um, you know, it's not tough. It's not a tough decision to run into a burning house to save your children. If your children are important to you, right? Like those actions are going to follow those beliefs. So check out, uh, Sam, samsilverstein.com. Check out, uh, his books on Amazon, uh, check out the accountability Institute. Um, they got a bunch of great resources up there and, uh, look for Sam somewhere because, uh, he is a phenomenal speaker and, uh, you just got a little bit of a taste today. So Sam, thanks so much for joining on the ethics experts, man. Thank you so much. It's really been an honor to be here. And um, anytime, I'm happy to come back and talk about accountability and ethics and workplace culture. Very good. Until next time.